I don't, I don't think that God would have so many calls to us, turn, repent, turn, repent, turn, repent, if we didn't have the ability to turn and repent. I think that God has given us all that ability to turn to him. And it truly is our choice to turn and repent. Yeah, I'll say the misunderstanding that humans are born at this neutral state uh, where they can, I'll say, choose good or bad is, I would say, is wrong. It's a misunderstanding um, of the human nature that we're born in with this sin nature. If that's the case, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. Why do you have the ability not to sin? Why because do you, why do you have the ability to sin? Because so I have the sin nature. That's what gives me the ability to sin. That's why I can be tempted. Yeah. Uh, it's written, but that you can overcome that, right? Only because God has changed my nature, right? Let's say the gospel is shared, and God sees fit that that person receive the gift of faith to believe the gospel to be true, confesses with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believes in his heart that God raised him from the dead, and you are saved, according to Romans ten nine. At that moment, I believe that's where free will comes into play. We will be judged how we used our free will during the sanctification process yeah. because it was within it was within the scope of practice. It yeah. was within your ability to resist evil. Right. Because you have been given a new heart, the free gift from God I to think choose that makes him. Sense. Yeah. Turn to page three hundred and ninety four. Clues were left behind that suggested a mystery, and to many humans, a mystery is irresistible. Unless I am convinced by scripture and by plain reason, my conscience is captive to the word of God. Long I pondered my king's Cryptic talk and victory. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. I guess I have a lot of things to ponder. Hey, y'all. Welcome to Pondering the Pages with Pierce and Kyle. And our friend Jonathan Hanna today. Today we have a special guest, Mr. Jonathan Hanna. What's up, boys? How are you? Good. How are you feeling? Uh, not nervous. Good, 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 good. Just kidding. He came locked, <laughs> locked and loaded. <laughs> I want to say not nervous because if I say nervous, then it's like, all right. Well, maybe if everybody's going to be scrutinizing me. I'm nervous. Well, they say the centers of the brain that detect nervousness versus excitement lie right beside each other. So it could just be excitement. Yeah. There we go. Being perceived we'll go as nervousness. That. Yeah. yeah. Excitement. Yeah. yeah if you, maybe if you say you're nervous, it'll kind of takes the power away from it you know yeah if i say i'm nervous yeah if you just admit if you are if you're if you're not then don't say it but yeah yeah that's true i'm nervous as a long tail cat in a room full of rocking chairs but if i say i'm nervous Walter. would that not maybe make me nervous because i'm declaring mm -hmm. i'm nervous hmm. i think we just get out there and run the play and uh, the nervousness goes away after that first good pop in the mouth if you're playing football <laughs> <laughs> Get yeah. your bell rung one time, and it's just like, eh, all right, I've had, that's the worst I'm going to get. Okay. Yeah. I didn't die. Yeah. Kyle, you want to start us off with a question? Actually, Jonathan, I think you have the bowl. Nope, Kyle's got it. Never mind. He I likes the bowl. He likes to. I like to control <laughs> the cookie jar. He likes to bogart that whole that bowl. Who's it from? Sharon Westfall in Newberry, Wisconsin. Okay. Hmm. How do you know all these cities? What is the whole counsel of God according to Acts chapter 20, verse 27? Acts chapter 20. I can honestly say uh, I don't know right now. What verses did you say? Acts 20, 27. You want so, to read those passages? Yeah, so Kyle, you've got the ESV. I've got the NASB. What translation is your Bible, Jonathan? I go with NASB as well. Nice. I found it to be the most accurate me too finally yeah. like my man that's refreshing <laughs> that's a good start for us that is that is a good start so kyle you read dsv first and then jonathan will read the nasb so i'm going to read starting in verse 26 if that's okay therefore i testify to you this day that i am innocent of the blood of all for i did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of god 
Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock on which the Holy Spirit has made your overseers, made you overseers to take care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I read 26 through 28. Okay. Okay. And ASB says, therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for your flock or for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So mine says the whole purpose of yeah. God. Kyle, you want to take a stab at it first? Let me read the study notes because I have a study Bible. Uh, we usually I think it's basically... Do that what, last. Okay. So basically this is the Apostle Paul. Yeah. And the Apostle Paul is everything that the Holy Spirit has taught him post-justification and everything that he had learned pre-justification. He applies all of that to teaching the church of God that he goes in and sets up elders and establishes churches. He teaches them basically everything that he knows about the characteristics, attributes of God that he sees in not only the Old Testament, but also what the Holy Spirit has led him through in his time of, in a sense, exile, prior to him going back to the leaders at Jerusalem, which would have been James and Peter at the time, and he was subject to the apostles. So he's teaching them everything that he learned under Gamaliel because he was a student of Gamaliel. And he was a super, super, super duper smart guy, according to scriptures. He said he was full of zeal over the Old Testament. And I think that he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. So I think that he took all of the Old Testament and he was able to, through the Holy Spirit, able to see Jesus throughout all of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. I don't want to interrupt you, but you've got a piece of glitter right there on the edge of your nose. It's a piercing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 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 So the I would say the was yeah, that distracting. It was for me. Was, I don't. I didn't see it on the camera. I looked over at the TV and I didn't see it on the camera. But it, it was for me in person here. I might need a new prescription on my glasses. So it, I didn't see it. it well, it, it's whenever he would he would get like this angle uh, and it yeah, would shine. Kinda, it would flutter, twinkle at you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> twinkle. Uh, so I, I, for uh, declaring the whole purpose of God, I, yeah, I would just say essentially he was. He was declaring the original Bible doctrine. He was well. He was forming Bible doctrine, biblical doctrine, where you take the plan of God from before the foundation of the world, His workings towards His uh, looking forward to His foreshadowing Christ and His work all throughout the Old Testament and the Old Law, the purpose of the Old Law, which was to convince the world of sin, and then. God's working out the salvation of the elect and Paul is declaring all of that the entire the plan the entire plan essentially from a to z um he touched he touched on the end a little bit but John really did that in revelation later on but it, but as far as as far as the entire plan and purposes of God that was just he didn't shy away from all of it so i, I would i guess i would just say an example of shying away from some of it is whenever you say Jesus came and died for our sins to save us, but you leave out the last part, which to save us from the wrath of God, which we all deserve because we're all sinners. So he didn't leave out anything. There's no detail that he left out. There was no aspect of it that he left out, but he gave us the entire thing and he didn't shrink away from, from declaring that. Yeah. And I think, I think it shows that he's, um, you know, the, the word shrink away. I mean, that, kind of gives an indication that maybe um, some of the things he had to say and do was difficult. Yeah. So, and he went through with the difficult task because sometimes we are tasked by mm -hmm. God with difficult things, but he's with us um, to get through those. He gives us strength. Yeah. Turn that mic out slightly. Like you can leave it where it's at. Yep. Just, yep. Just like that. Yep. Gotcha. Perfect. Yeah. So I think I'm you good with that answer. Yeah. I'm pretty happy with all those. So, Jonathan, tell us a little bit about yourself. What uh, what made you want to come on on the podcast? We're happy to have you, but yeah, what made you. what made you want to come on the podcast um, and kind of 
give a brief uh, yeah. history. So, <clears throat> I guess for me, what made me want to come on was I've I've kind of um, I've kind of wanted to do YouTube podcasts for a while, but um, you can grab that thing and put it wherever you want yeah. and manhandle it and do however you want with it. Yeah. So. I, uh, I started to put out some YouTube videos a while back and, um, <clears throat> I felt like after I put those out, like the Lord rebuked me, hmm. you know, not to put those out right now. Cause I'm just not quite ready, you know? So, um, maybe coming on with you guys, give me some, uh, insight into, you know, how to do things mm -hmm. appropriately. Yeah. How God wants me to do them. Hmm. What were the YouTube videos about? What'd you... Um, you know, just scripture, uh, preaching scripture, basically. Uh, I had some over, um, like dreams and mm -hmm. stuff like that talking. I mean, some of the stuff I talked about was maybe a little controversial in the body. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, but you know, still sticking with scripture. Yeah. But I think that, uh, sometimes I think that sometimes we get to this point where, uh, we, we're doing something maybe out of pride, right? Instead of doing something for the right reasons, mm -hmm. you know, God can call you to do something and you can act out of flesh still. Mm -hmm. Right. So if God calls you to do a podcast or whatever it is, um, you got to search your heart and be diligent uh, that you're, you're not doing it out of fame, mm -hmm. you know, uh, self-interest, right? Uh, the reason that we do podcasts, the reason that we do anything is for the glory of God, as Kyle spoke that today. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, whenever I put those videos on, and I've taken them down, um, but I put them on initially, a few of them, and I think uh, a lot of that, uh, my heart just wasn't right, mm -hmm. you know, 100%. Not, not, that, not that when we do things, it's... Um, think that sometimes we can do things and it's like maybe partially right, but not all the way right. Yeah. You know? So anyways, uh, you guys have a little bit of different perspectives than I do on some things. So mm -hmm. I thought, you know what, we can, I can show up and give you guys my perspective mm -hmm. that may be a little bit different than yours. Absolutely. Um, I think that's the way we grow. Right. Is talking about stuff, mm -hmm. working through them. So, so what's one of those, uh, what's one of those, I'll let you kind of <laughs> direct us. What's, oh, what's, man. what's okay. one of the first ones or what do you want to talk about first? Or do yeah. you want to? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, um, I guess for me, uh, you know, I think the controversial things in the body are the gifts of the spirit, um, you know, salvation, eternal security, or, or can we lose our salvation? Mm-hmm. So I think those things are, are a bit controversial. And, um, I think that on, I think on the eternal security, um, I've done a lot of research on that, a lot of, a lot of studying. And, um, personally I've come to the conclusion that we can lose our salvation. Uh, but I don't think it's easy. I don't think it's easy to do that because James talks about us all being, um, none of us are without sin. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, uh, I think it's a, it can be a difficult thing to do because God's very gracious. Mm -hmm. He's very merciful and he walks with us. And, um, so some of the scriptures that I haven't seen people bring would be, um, there's one in Ezekiel. I think it's Ezekiel 18. You read the whole chapter on eternal security. Uh, nobody, nobody ever looks at that one that I've seen and says, Hey, this, this could give some evidence for eternal security or not. Mm -hmm. uh, do we want to read that one? Yeah. 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 Talk about it. Starting in verse one. Yeah. I hope you guys don't mind a little reading from the word of God. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, declares the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. 
If a man is righteous and does what is just and right, if he does not eat upon the mountains or lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, does not defile his neighbor's wife or approach a woman in her time of menstrual impurity, does not oppress anyone but restores to the debtor his pledge, commits no robbery, gives his bread to the hungry, and covers the naked with a garment, does not lend an interest or take any profit, withholds his hand from injustice, executes true justice between man and man, walks in my statutes and keeps my rules by acting faithfully. He is righteous. He shall surely live, declares the Lord God. If he fathers a son who is violent, a shedder of blood, who does any of these things, though he himself did none of these things, who even eats upon the mountain, defiles his neighbor's wife, oppresses the poor and needy, commits robbery, does not restore the pledge, lifts up his eyes to the idols, commits abomination, lends at interest and takers profit, and takes profit, shall he then live? He shall not live. He has done all these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon himself. Now suppose this man fathers a son who sees all these sins that his father has done. He sees and does not do likewise. He does not eat upon the mountains or lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, does not defile his neighbor's wife, nor does he oppress anyone, exacts no pledge, commits no robbery, but gives his bread to the hungry and covers the naked with a garment withholds his hand from iniquity, takes no interest or profit, obeys my rules and walks in my statutes. He shall not die for his father's iniquity. He shall surely live. As for his father, because he practiced extortion, robbed his brother and did what is not good among his people, behold, he shall die for his iniquity. Yet you say, why should not the son suffer for the iniquity of the father? When the son has done what is just and right and has been careful to observe all my statutes, he shall surely live. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. But if a person, but if a wicked person turns away from all his sins that he has committed and keeps all my statutes and does what is just and right, he shall surely live. Okay, pause for just okay. a second. So I just that's a I'm going to make a special note on that. So if a wicked person turns from his sins, he mm-hmm. will surely live. All right, go to the next one. Okay. So, but if a wicked person turns away from all his sins that he has committed and keeps all my statutes and does what is just and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of the transgressions that he has committed shall be remembered against him for the righteousness that he has done. He shall live. Have any, have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked declares the Lord God and not rather that he should turn away from his way and live. But when a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and does injustice and does the same abominations that the wicked person does, shall he live. None of the righteous deeds that he has done shall be remembered. For if the treachery of which he is guilty and the sin he has committed, for then he shall die. And, what, and I want to come back and talk about that, but we can finish the chapter. It's almost done. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just. Hear now, house of Israel, is my way not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? When a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and does injustice, he shall die for it. For the injustice that he has done, he shall die. Again, when a wicked person turns away from the wickedness he has committed and does what is just and right, he shall live his life, or save his life. But as he considered and turned away from all the transgression that he had committed, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, The way of the Lord is not just. O house of Israel, are my ways not just? Is it not your ways that are not just? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, lest iniquity be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed, and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. So turn and live. Okay, so, all right, so first of all, we need to break this down a little bit. What's God talking about? Uh, this is a you know, prophetic word from God directly mm-hmm. speaking to Ezekiel. What's he talking about here? Is he talking about um, actual physical death? I mean, we, we all face physical death. Everybody will die. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't think that we can rightfully conclude that the Lord is saying physical death. Mm-hmm. We all die. Mm-hmm. He's already made that clear. Um, and he's saying that if we turn and repent, we will live, mm-hmm. right? So if it was physical death, it would make it not true right? because we all die. Right, exactly. So it has to be spiritual. Okay, I'm good with that. Right? It has to be either, um, it has to, has to do with heaven and hell, mm-hmm. right? So <clears throat> I think 
you know, we go and look in the New Testament for a lot of answers. And they're actually in the Old Testament as well. You know, Paul said, uh, one of the things that Paul said, I don't remember exactly where it was, maybe to Timothy, he said, all scriptures, God breathed. Second Timothy, Timothy 3, 3 16. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So, so we can find our answers in the Old Testament. Um, so, but what makes a person righteous? Christ. It's in, Christ. In, okay. Exactly. Yeah, I was going to ask in the, yeah. in the old law or in the new law or old covenant or new covenant. But... It, it, it's, it's essentially the same thing though in the old covenant. Cause it was the faith like Abraham mm-hmm. and God. Right. Mm-hmm. Because even Abraham sinned, mm-hmm. even Job sinned. He was blameless before mm-hmm. man, but he was still, he still sinned. You know, God showed up and said, uh, this is where your pr- proud waves halt. You know, so he, he sinned against God, mm-hmm. right? His heart was not without sin. A lot of times we look at some of these people and we're like, man, they're so righteous. No, nobody's righteous. We're no, right- not one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We're righteous because of Christ, mm-hmm. you know? And these people are righteous because of their faith in, in God. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they still couldn't live perfect. So, <clears throat> so we take Ezekiel 18 and we see a spiritual, um, either uh, a spiritual life or spiritual death. And uh, God makes it very clear that if a righteous man turns from righteousness, he will die. So he will, he will go to hell. It's where, a spiritual death. Where was that at? Where? Uh... Uh, 24, um, 18, 24. So, but when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, commits iniquity and does and does according to all the abominations that a wicked man does. Will he live? Question mark. All his righteous deeds, which he has done, will not be remembered for his treachery, which he has committed, and his sin, which he has committed for them. He will die. Mm-hmm. So I never see this scripture coming up uh, when we talk about this eternal security versus not. But, you know, even in the New Testament, uh, it's a little bit clouded. And it depends on where you read, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, some, some parts of the new Testament, you're going to read it and you're going to say, you know, Paul was, Paul was clearly making a point that you could lose your salvation. And, um, let's see. In first Corinthians nine 27, uh, he said, but I strictly discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified Mm -hmm. from preaching. I would say. I, I wouldn't say that's from preaching. I, I think he's talking about salvation in that scripture, but we can, we can, where, that one where are we at there? First Corinthians nine twenty seven. Yeah. I'll just kind of start there in verse 24. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. And I, I think that, I think that pre, I mean, the, 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 those verses clearly indicate salvation in my mind, mm-hmm. that that's what he's talking about. Um, but you can go to other spots. I'm sure y'all can throw the verses at me that says you can't lose your salvation. Mm-hmm. I, I know they're there. I used to believe that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I I can't conclude that whenever I take the Bible as a whole, Yeah, yeah. you know, if I, if I read it, uh, and break it down and take everything and I don't just cherry pick some verses, uh, I really can't conclude that. And especially in, um, you know, the old Testament is very direct, Mm -hmm. you know, God spoke to the prophets and gave us a lot of very direct direction. The new Testament, um, God spoke a, a little bit differently, you know, than the Old Testament. Um, he did speak somewhat the same, uh, but the New Testament is more of a interpretation of what's already given. You know, Jesus coming and saying, hey, look, guys, y'all had it wrong. You didn't understand some of these things I'm saying. Let me, I've, I've already given you uh, these words. Let me give them to you more clearly so you may understand. Uh, so, but if we if we take this Ezekiel um, and we consider it for what it says, um, then there has to be 
There has to be the ability to, you know, become unrighteous and not enter uh, heaven, you know, not have salvation. Uh, <clears throat> so what, well, how can we do that? I think that's the question. How can we do what? How, how can we lose our salvation? Because our salvation isn't based on works. Right. Right. So there's, there's nothing we can do necessarily to gain salvation. Uh, but what we can do, um, in a sense, is have faith mm-hmm. and belief. Right. That's how we gain salvation. Um, I would say that th- this is how I would interpret everything. Is if <clears throat> if you continue on in sin, willful sin, willful. Okay. Um, your heart will grow cold, and God. God won't necessarily reject you. This is my opinion because of grace, but you will reject God in your heart because of that willful continued sin. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a, I was listening to a a guy the other day. He was saying with uh, like sexual sin, pornography, a lot of men struggle with that. He said, um, you know, every time you're about to do that, you better, you better, imagine and believe a gun stuck to your head because it's that serious if you continue on in the sin Mm -hmm. because uh pornography is willful you can't tell me it's not because there's there's going to be these opportunities to come out of that so when you continue on it's it's becomes willful Mm -hmm. now if some lady passes before you you know on the street and she catches your eye, that may not be, God may not say that's willful, you know, that you caught your eye and you turned away. Once you came to your senses, like, okay, I can't look, I've got to turn my head, I can't think those thoughts. Um, <clears throat> but when you conceive that sin, uh, we'll say masturbation, that comes all the way, it's fully conceived whenever mm-hmm. you're, you're at the end of that. So <clears throat> I would say that that's willful. And I would say that many Christians are in willful sin. However, God is so gracious with this. He does give us a lot of opportunity, but we have to take it serious. Mm-hmm. You know, those, those type of things, we've got to really look at them and say, man, I've got a gun to my head. You know, if I keep doing this, it's going to lead me down this path of destruction. You know, so what's your thoughts? I think as far as, and just going down to eternal security, um, I think it also boils down to the, the perseverance of the saints. Yeah. I think justification and sanctification are two totally different things. I think that the work that he started in you, he will bring to completion. I think that a person that, and this would be the, this would be the argument mm-hmm. that would say that, well, that person was never truly saved. That yeah. person was yeah. never truly justified. Yeah. Because if they were truly justified, they would not have fallen away. Yeah. And I think that it is a revelation for a lot of people. I mean, Jesus even says, you call me Lord, but you don't do what I tell you to do. I think that they believe because of the signs and wonders, but they didn't truly believe in him. Yeah. And I think that if you read the scriptures and the Lord tells you to do something and you're in willful disobedience, then it's a revelation to should be not only yourself, but also to, if I'm walking closely with you, it's just like, man, you're not taking this Lord thing seriously. Yeah. You're just wanting to be your buddy, be your yeah. friend. So I think that justification, we're justified by faith alone. And I think that that is a free gift given to us by God, the gift of faith. And then <clears> when <throat> it, it also says in the Old Testament and the New Testament that obedience leads to righteousness. Yeah. yeah and I think, that. and I think that, I think that that is sanctification. Yeah. Um, I yeah. think there are several different parables of Jesus and teachings of Jesus that I can get a little bit confused at at times mm-hmm. that, you know, you'll be cast out where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's a lot of different thoughts on that is that because that's not yet, that's not the eternal lake of fire because the eternal lake of fire hasn't happened yet. You know, so hell has not been thrown into the eternal lake of fire from, a, 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 let's say, an eschatological timeline. So I think that will you be separated and it comes down to rewards uh, for me, a judgment seat of Christ. And I know that there's some differing thoughts even at the table as far as that goes. 
the imperishable crown that he's talking about, is he talking about everlasting life or is he talking about the potential for gaining of reward that is attainable through living a life of obedience and putting our bodies in self-discipline mode mm-hmm. to reject whatever willful sin that it is that we have. So I think judgment seat of Christ, there looks to be at least five crowns that are attainable if we look at that. Yeah. So I think that are you potentially disqualifying yourself from gaining that particular crown? I think eternal life is a free gift given to us, but the other crowns, uh, crown of righteousness, the crown of life, uh, the imperishable crown, it, a lot of different terms for those. And I think that we would have to study each of those crowns out. And I don't know if we have enough time to yeah. do that today, but I'm not a hundred percent certain that right there, what he's talking about, I think that he's disqualifying himself from that particular race. Like you said, from the very beginning, when you prefaced it this way, you said it would be very difficult to lose yeah. your salvation. Um, but I think that is because of the grace of God, because he doesn't give up on us easy, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. <clears throat> but, but, you, I, he but does, I, but he does give up eventually. No, I, I think, I think from my understanding, it would be, um, that we've turned from him, you know, because, uh, I think he given, he's given us, uh, like marriage mm-hmm. as a, as a sign mm-hmm. of like his love for us. Mm-hmm. Sure. Right. And even in marriage, you see that. God said, Hey, don't divorce, Mm -hmm. don't do this. But yet he gave provision for divorce. You know, he did, he did say it's allowed, but he didn't want us to do it. You know? So if your spouse hates you, if she hates you, everything that you do, she hates you. Um, and she wants to leave because she hates you because she doesn't like your laws or your rules or whatever. Um, love would say go you know what i mean i'm not going to force you to stay and so what happens when we're in willful sin and disobedience is we have a hardened heart Mm -hmm. that starts to form it starts to become calloused because we can't or we won't turn from the sin Um, and so when we don't turn from that sin that hardened heart starts to take place and um, you know in time and that has just continued and continued and continued uh, in our hearts, whether we say it with our mouth or not, our hearts are turned from God. Yeah. And so <clears throat> that would be how we would lose our salvation because our hearts are far from him. They've turned completely away from him. And we can come to church and we can say, oh, God's real. But what's the scripture say? It says that even the demons know he's real and mm-hmm. they shudder. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, so <clears throat> we can... You know, we can say he's real. We mm-hmm. can say we believe. That's totally fine. But having the Holy Spirit in us and and walking with God, that's that's two different things. And then if you remember, Jesus said to the apostles at one point, he even told them, he said, if, if you don't repent, you will all perish. And so what's repentance? Turning. From. Turning. So turning to Christ and walking with him. Well, what, is, what did Jesus say? Follow me. Yeah. Follow me. So we, we have this, we have that. We know what salvation is. It's what Abraham did. You know, he, he went on he, he, to sacrifice his kid. He had faith like God will raise him or whatever. You know, that that's what our salvation is, is, is following Christ, you know, having that heart that's turned towards him. <laughs> but that willful sin, you are, when you sin, you're in league with Satan. <clears throat> Satan has... He has some, he has a little bit of a hold, right? You, you've, you've broken uh, God's law and God's way to move to the dark side, you know? And so Satan has, um, he's going to, he's going to come after you. It, any of us will, I mean, all Christians know that sure. when we sin, there's condemnation, right? Who condemns us? Yeah. Satan. Yeah. Right. He's the one coming against us. So, so, would you... so there's a hold that starts to take place. And so over time, you, t- you say, thir- well, I mean, look at these people and um, <clears throat> these celebrities um, and, and some of these people that uh, they, you know, they're getting in trouble for child pornography, right? What Do you think they just, you think they were born, look at, you know, interested in that? No, they partnered with the devil and sin 
<clears throat> they continued in that sin. That sin led them to a darker spot. You know, uh, that that's how addictions and sin works. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a person doesn't start off as a drunk, right? Mm -hmm. They get there progressively. Sure. So I'd say that as, a, as humans, if we continue in those sins, we will turn. Our hearts will grow hardened and callous to God. And that would be our way that we could lose salvation. So uh, every, everything I've heard so far about uh, the state of the heart, the heart becoming hard, uh, being hardened and everything, the only language that I can think, correct me if I'm wrong, but the only language that I can think of that's used in, in Scripture, where those terms are stated in Scripture, are speaking of non-believers uh, or are encouraging uh, um, encouraging believers to not, like uh, I'm thinking of Hebrews, where it says, don't allow your hearts to be hardened as in the day, in, as in the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers uh, saw my works for 40 years and... and yeah. um, so it's, but it's, they weren't they weren't unbelievers. Uh, Israelites were actually a were like a prelude to the Christians today. I mean, God of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was their God. So they were they no, were they believers. were their, they were their their fathers, their forefathers. But God Yahweh has always been the God of the Israelites. They right yeah, right yeah yeah. yeah 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 that's what I'm saying. But they they were like um, they were like the Christians of today in a sense. I mean, there's many wandering Christians that are doing the same things that the Israelites did in the desert, you know, that are committing sins against God. Mm -hmm. And God still says, you're my people. Mm -hmm. Quit doing it. Turn. Mm -hmm. Turn from your wicked ways so I can heal your land, mm -hmm. you know, so you get out of the desert, but you stay in the desert. But we, no matter what we do, we do see graciousness of God mm -hmm. and mercy. Even in the midst of so much sin and people, we yeah. continue to see this grace and mercy. Yeah, and so, uh, but not everybody. Not everybody in the, you know, some of the, some of them in the wilderness, they perished. They mm -hmm. didn't. They, yeah, yeah. they didn't see the promised land. Well, and it's know? like Paul says, not all who are who are of Israel are, or not who are not all who are of Abraham are of Israel, or vice versa. Yeah. Um, but it's it's so it's not a it's not a hereditary or it's not a yeah. it's not a ethnicity thing it's yeah. it's a it's a part of the covenant thing uh but one thing you said was it was when you sin there's condemnation uh but i would just point to romans 8 1 therefore there is now no condemnation for those of us who are in christ yeah but that condemnation you, is of satan right not of god which so, one? The so when we sin, Satan mm -hmm. Satan goes before God and says he accuses us. He, He's the accuser. Yeah. So that would be that condemnation. So I would Satan <clears throat> Satan cannot. Go, I would say Satan cannot condemn. Satan accuses. No, he he can't. He can't. He he has no authority, but right. he can try, and he does yeah. try. Yeah, and then and so Romans eight one, I would say there's no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ. Yeah, um, I think that's just a what's that word. We're saying the same thing. Semantics. Yeah, semantics. Um, yeah, yeah, and I'm each each time I say this, I believe it more and more. I've been saying it a lot more in the past year, but so I think semantics are really important. Yeah. The there's a difference between uh, an accusation and condemnation. There, Satan goes before the Father to accuse us of our sins. Yeah. And but then he says my wrath for those sins was placed on Christ. I do not condemn them for those sins. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, th I, I would say, so basically what you're saying is, uh, is Satan can't condemn yeah. only God can. I agree with that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah I agree. Yeah. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. He, he accuses us, Yeah, yeah the but, accuser but in the brother. spiritual realm, we face the, the accusation. Oh yeah. You for, know, yeah. Like for God, sure. God will let us feel that accusation mm -hmm. against us. Yeah. And we can, we can choose whether or not, I think that that's right. Why we study the scriptures to show ourselves approved and have our spiritual senses exercised because the word is sharper than any two edged sword able to divide the soul and the spirit asunder. It's almost like Satan comes to attack our, uh, I'm going to use this term and I know that some people don't like the tripartite being, but Satan comes to uh, accuse our soul, our mind, will, and emotions. He tries to get in our head and he plays in, in that battlefield because he knows that there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Yeah. I think that is yeah. basically what that is referencing is you are not going to suffer the wrath of God. That's mm -hmm. the condemnation that it is. It yeah. 
that condemnation is not going to fall upon a person who has truly been justified. Or, I mean, if you can use the word as predestined, chosen, if a person has been chosen to have the gift of faith, there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. So you won't suffer eternal wrath in the eternal lake of fire. You'll spend eternity with God because you've gained eternal life through what Christ did, not anything that we did because it's filthy rags. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think an aspect that's really important in this discussion that um, sometimes gets left out is, is the character of God. Um, what does it say? What does it say about God's character? Um, so let me back up a little bit before I get there. So uh, another thing that I think is important is to view the salvation. I'll say the salvation of the elect to view that. Uh, step out of our our human selves and step out of our human eyes and see it from God's point of view. Mm -hmm. So what's God doing in the salvation of his elect? What was the reason for doing that in the first place? So in eternity past, before the foundation of the world, God the Father and God the Son had this plan to redeem uh, his chosen people, and it's a, it's a gift given from God the Father to God the Son. It's a bride. We are a bride being prepared um, being made holy, being made spotless for the father to give to his son. Yeah, but the but the bride gets to say yes. Okay, so so we're <laughs> we're a bride being given from uh, God the Father to God the Son, um, and God is sanctifying that gift to give to His Son. Mm -hmm. So when we view salvation, uh, when we view you know salvation, all three parts, when we view that. Um, from God's perspective, it kind of helps clarify things a little bit. So with that being said, um, what does it say about God's character? If from the, from before the foundation of the world, God has chosen this people to give to his son as a bride. And he, let's say at the end of it, after, after everything is done, God the Father comes to the Son and says, here's the people I chose, and here are the ones that stuck around. There is a lot of them that I lost. I really tried to talk them into it. Man, I really tried to, to save them, but they were just either they were beyond my ability to save or uh, I didn't want to intrude on their free will and, and force them to be saved. So here's what's left over of this bride that I'm of this gift that I'm giving you. Uh, it, here, here's what it would have looked like, but some of them didn't choose you back. So, uh, here's, here's what's left over. Uh, that's kind of a oversimplification of it. But, um, so the way that I see things is God chooses his elect. God chose from eternity past before the foundation of the world, God chose his elect and, uh, had the plan to redeem us. And, um, uh, Kyle helped me out with the verse. Um, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. I can't remember where that is. Uh, but he will bring that to completion. And then Romans, uh, eight, 29 and 30, uh, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of a son yeah. so that he would be the firstborn, am firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called those whom he called. He also justified and those whom he justified, he also glorified. So there's, in that, especially in verse 30, you see this, it's called the golden chain of, of salvation is what some yeah. refer to it as. Um, so you see this, those whom he predestined. And if we, and if we study out, uh, God's predestining in other scriptures, uh, those whom he foreknew before the foundation of the world, he predestined them and all of those whom he predestined, he called those and all of those who he called, he, he justified those and those whom he justified, he glorified. Um, and so it's, it's this, uh, it's this, to me, that's definite language. You know what I'm trying to say? Um, so I, that's, I think the character of God in when we step back and, and say it's, it's more, it's not, this is a part of it, but it's not only this, that God created everything, uh, man sinned and became corrupt. So God came, God made this plan to, Sanct uh, justify and sanctify and glorify them to redeem us yeah. um, and and to make us holy again and to give us eternal life. That is a part of it. Mm -hmm. But the reason that he's doing all that was 
and it is to give his son a bride to get a spotless lamb yeah. uh, who he died for. So it's, it's, it's for someone to, I'll, I'll just say this, this will kind of sum up what I'm trying to say a little bit. God's sovereignty has uh, precedence over the human will. That's I, I agree. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I agree with that, but I don't think that it has precedence, but it doesn't mean that he will um, override the human will. I would look at Jonah ability. and Paul. Jonah and Paul. Uh, are you talking about early or when? Give me an example. Uh, so Jonah, Jonah, go to these people in Nineveh and tell them to repent. Yeah. No, I'm not doing that. And yeah. runs and runs and runs and <clears throat> eventually. He didn't take over, though. He didn't take over his body like a robot. No. What he did do, though, is get him in some perilous situations. <laughs> yeah. So so yeah. Jonah's free will still was there. It was just like, hey, Jonah, you got to be an idiot at this point if you're not going to go do what God told you to do. Because God's, you know, you've mm-hmm. been swallowed by a well. Right. Yeah. So, I, so that's. I don't, I don't think anywhere in Scripture, um, <clears throat> other than maybe like. You can almost read uh, when God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you can almost read that as um, God taking away. But I would say that that was almost like a situation where uh, Pharaoh's wicked. He's God's already done with him. You know, God says God says He gives us all uh, opportunity to repent. He mm-hmm. even gave Jezebel mm-hmm. opportunity to repent. That's what yeah. he. That's what he told his. Yeah. Uh, Elisha was it Elisha or Elijah? Elisha, yeah, he gave her uh, opportunity to repent. Um, so, but she didn't, and you know, just to get it out there, like I completely yeah. reject, uh, from my understanding of scripture, I completely reject the idea that God has <clears throat> pre selected some, uh, you know, to, to heaven while others are thrown by the wayside. You know, I, I reject it, uh, the predestination thing, because I believe that if he's predestined some to heaven, he's predestined some to hell and there's nothing you can do about it. But I don't, I don't think that God would have so many calls to us, turn, repent, turn, repent, turn, repent. If we didn't have the ability to turn and repent. I think that God has given us all that ability to turn to him. And it truly is our choice to turn and repent. And, and even from a life application, from a life application, if we take the understanding of, um, look, there's nothing you can do. You know, God's, God's pre-selected you. Uh, you're going to heaven no matter what. You take that that as a life application and you tell that to people. You know what happens? We have a bunch of people saying, oh, I prayed that prayer. Mm-hmm. I prayed the sinner's prayer. I'm saved. You know, when the scriptures tell us that we know people by their fruit, mm-hmm. right? And Jesus said, if you love me, obey my commands right? so I, I would uh I would, God, and, and i would ask you is mm-hmm. god going to bring into heaven people that don't love him no nope. he's no, he won't. not mm-hmm. and what did he tell us he said if you do love me mm-hmm. obey my commands so i think there's a few uh presuppositions in there that that lead to a misunderstanding of the doctrine of election um and also the doctrine of um I had a friend uh, that that I'm believed losing the name of it. I had a friend that believed he uh, he couldn't be saved. Mm-hmm. He went to church. He was taught this election doctrine, mm-hmm. and it drove him crazy. So I, I think it's based on a mis- misinterpretation, misunderstanding of the doctrines themselves. So there's, um, so the doctrine, the doctrine of of original sin and or total depravity. So one of one of the presuppositions that I heard in your in what you just said is that. Basically, or in other words, one of the things that was implied is that basically man um, starts out as like at this neutral good, that's a neutral state uh, where 
basically we're in the middle and there's this scale of good on the bad, right, good on the right, bad on the left. And you have the ability to go one way or the other. Isn't um, that what we saw with Adam and Eve? Yeah, but that's a that was that was before Adam had the very first the thing sin nature. Saw. Adam Adam and Eve weren't created with the sin nature. So the sin nature is what's different between Adam and Eve and everybody else after them. Uh, Adam was our federal head in the garden, and whenever he sinned, uh, that sin is applied to all of us, and Adam all die. Yeah. Um, and so uh, in Romans three, uh, let me start in. We'll start in verse 5, Romans 3, verse 5. Uh, Paul says, But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? I am speaking in human terms. May it never be. For otherwise, how would God judge the world? But if through my lie the truth of God abounded to his glory, why am I still being judged as a sinner? And why not say, as we as we are slander, slanderously reported and as some say that claim that we say, let us do evil that good may come. Their condemnation is just. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both, both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. Jews and Greeks, all of humanity are all under sin. sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave, and with their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips. And then he goes on uh, continuing in that. That's from uh, quoting Isaiah. So there's the, the, the misunderstanding, or the, yeah, I'll say the misunderstanding that humans are born at this neutral state uh, where they can... I'll say choose good or bad is I would say is wrong. It's a misunderstanding um, of the human nature that we're born in with this sin nature. If that's the case, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. Why do you have the ability not to sin? Because why do you have the ability to sin? Because so I have the sin nature. That's what gives me the ability to sin. That's why I can be tempted. Uh, It's written that you can overcome that, right? Only because God has changed my nature. Right. Before before God changes my nature, before God gives me the gift of faith, removes the heart of stone, which is what I was thinking about earlier when yeah. you were talking about the hardness of heart. But if you love those demons so much that you don't let them go. Well, let me get there. So yeah. while before we are <laughs> given the gift of faith, um, we, when we, whenever we have this heart of stone, it requ- for us to choose God, it requires God acting first. He has to remove the heart of stone and pl- give us a heart of flesh yeah. and change our nature, make us a new creation before yeah. we're even able to choose God. Yeah. The only reason that I can love God is because he gave me that ability to. So the only reason that I can uh, choose good or, and not choose sin is because he's given me that ability to. Uh, in my opinion, scripture is very clear that before that, we're slaves to sin. We are in love with sin. We're enemies of God. We hate God. We hate God's law. We're at in, enmity with God, mm. and we we love sin and we're slaves to sin. And, yeah. and that's what that's whenever we say Christ has come to set us free, He saved us from the wrath of God, and He set us free from death and sin. That sin is one of the things that He set us free from. Yeah. Before He did that, and before that's applied to us, we're complete sa- slaves of sin. We cannot choose good. No one seeks after good. No one seeks after God. No, not one. Um, so the the misconception that humans are just begin at this neutral place uh, where they can lean one way or the other is a misunderstanding of scripture. And uh, we are all, um, because of our sin, we are all condemned for hell. And so the, uh, what you talked about earlier sometimes has the label of, of double predestination, where if God predestined some for heaven, that automatically means that he predestined some for hell. Yeah. Um, I can't say that that's, Ultimately wrong, but I don't agree with that. Um, yeah. And this is this might be semantics, but the way that I the way my understanding is, we're all headed for hell because of our sin, and God, uh, because of His perfect wisdom and because of His good pleasure, chose to save some from that, chose to redeem some. And that sounds really unfair, but Paul says in Romans nine, "Well, who are you, O man, to answer back to God?" And then on top of that, um, 
didn't God, God is, say in, in the scripture we read that he wishes that none should perish? Yeah, but have has anyone ever perished? There will be some, yeah. Okay. So God's so will doesn't always take place. His desire his his desire is not overrided by his will. His perfect and so yeah. why is that? Well, God is in in the death of in the physical death of everyone, God is glorified. In the physical death of the saint, God is glorified in his grace and his mercy and Christ's work on the cross. In the death of the sinner, God is glorified in his justice and and that absolute perfect justice will be done and is done. And and everyone will glorify God whether they want to or not. Everyone will glorify God. And, whether it's his mercy and grace or it's in his justice, all will glorify God. Yeah. I, I just, uh, I can't conclude with what I understand of scripture and, and reading Ezekiel 18 that, um, and even second, I think it's second Peter. I think Peter, <coughs> Peter says the same thing that, uh, it's not God's will that any should perish. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, is that, does that mean God's not going to allow any to perish? No, God's will is is will not desire. Is that not the same thing? No. No? It's my desire to eat cake, but it's my will to not do that and eat carrots instead. Yeah. <clears throat> right. So does will uh, supersede desire? God's. Well, if that was the case, then we'd all go to heaven. Because God's will is that none should perish. Okay, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. That's fair. Yeah. Um, well, so I've I've heard it talk. Kyle might know more about this, but I've heard it talk uh, that there's, and this is extra biblical language, but there's God's permissive will and then His uh, absolute will. What's the word for that? But it basically, uh, God does not will that any should perish, or God does not desire. What's even the language in that verse? I would say that God's, I'd say this is the same as, <clears throat> as God's will that no Christian sin. We take, um, Second God's Peter will 3. that nobody would perish mm -hmm. is the same thing that, that God's will is that none would sin. But yet because of free will, because we can see that throughout scripture or else God would not give us a call to repent. That'd be wild. That wouldn't even make sense. It's like, God, why are you giving us a call to repent? When we can't do it anyways, that that you have to do everything. This may not be this may not be applicable. So if it's not, just reject it. I think Hebrews chapter twelve, uh, verse twelve. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees, and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone, and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Get close, get closer to your mic. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Mm. Mm. So I think mm. he... He wanted to repent. He wanted the birthright back. He had a he had birthright and he gave it up. Yeah. He yeah. he sold his birthright. Yeah. And I think that obviously that is old covenant, but I think that that is in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews. Mm -hmm. And obviously we have to keep in context that yeah. that whoever the author of this is, whether it's Barnabas, whether it's Paul, mm -hmm. whoever it is, is yeah. writing to Hebrew Christians. Right. It's all God's word too. Yeah. So. I think that with that being said, and this is just my stance on it, maybe wrong, maybe right. I don't think that for me, I don't know that free will is applicable until justification. And at justification begins free will where it's a cooperative effort on behalf of the believer and the Holy Spirit working together for sanctification. Mm. I think that the... Yeah, it, it kind of makes sense. That... That's the way that I see yeah. it. There, there's a point somewhere in here that says, uh, uh, maybe Paul said, you know, don't miss your hour of visitation. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's I, like there's going to come upon every person on the earth this point in time where God's knocking. And he's saying, hey, turn from your sin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And it's like the the gift of faith. I think that we all agree at the table that we're saved by faith alone. It's not of good works. Yeah. And I would say that choosing God would be a good work. So I, I'd sometimes get a little bit mixed up on that. And mm. But I really think that justification is a free gift of God for a person. Let's just say that there is an altar call and it is real. Yeah. I, 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 I'm not able to size and measure what's going on in the inside of a man's heart that God is quickening that. But say the gospel is shared and God sees fit that that person received the gift of faith to believe the gospel to be true, confesses with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believes in his heart that God raised him from the dead and you are saved according to Romans 10, 9. At that moment, I believe that's where free will comes into play. Because it looks like sanctification, sanctification begins at the moment of justification and doesn't end until glorification or death. And I think sanctification is the cooperative effort of not quenching the Holy Spirit in cooperative effort to use your free will to discipline the body, to don't let sin reign in yeah. your your body because I think that there are several there are a couple of passages of scripture that Paul uses especially in First Thessalonians five and Colossians that your body soul and spirit would be saved. I think that the body salvation is glorification, which will happen. The work that God started in you will come to completion. I think the soul I think the soul aspect of us is the sanctification work. Yeah. I think the spirit, the spirit salvation is eternal salvation. That is a free gift of God to have the gift of faith. It says you're born again, uh, but not born of, of water, but born of water and the spirit being born of water is the, the breaking of the water that happens at actual conception. And I think Nicodemus in John three um, has this conversation, me being an old man, am I supposed to go back into the mother's womb and God or Jesus talks about the wind yeah. there. And I think that that is one of those where uh, obviously Jesus in his, in his earthly ministry of from 30 to 33 performed many, many miracles and signs and wonders. And I think John chapter 20 even alludes to the miracles that recorded in the book of John were recorded. So some would believe. So I think that that is, those are ordained miracles given to Jesus to prove that he was the Messiah. But obviously me and you now 2000 plus years removed from those scenes, we have the written word and we've been given the gift of faith to believe it without seeing. But I think that free will for me, and just as the way that I understand it, whether I'm wrong or right, I think just based on scripture, I think it is for, and because I'm I believe in an actual millennial reign of Christ. Yeah. And a thousand years. Yeah. Yeah. I, I believe in that. And I think that what determines your role and responsibility during the millennial reign of Christ is your use of free will during your sanctification mm -hmm. process. Yeah. And obviously you're in a glorified state because, yeah. you know, first Thessalonians four says the, the dead in Christ will rise first. And then those of us who remain, so everybody may not physically die. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it does say that, doesn't it? Yes. Clearly yeah. says that. So, yeah. so, um, for the, the great he'll descend and the voice of an archangel, the, the trumpet blast, which would be the seven yeah. of the trumpets, and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then those of us who are still here will be transformed in the twinkling of eye to meet him in the clouds. Mm -hmm. And I think that we'll be, you know, I think that that is where the judgment seat of Christ happens. Mm -hmm. And that will be where we as believers who have been justified through the gift of faith and faith alone. We will be judged how we used our free will during the sanctification process. Yeah. Because it was within, it was within the scope of practice. It yeah. was within your ability to resist evil right? because you have been given a new heart, the free gift from God I to think choose that makes him. Sense. Yeah. It makes sense it to makes me. It makes sense to me too. Uh, but at the same time, I think that what doesn't make sense to me though, <clears throat> though, is this aspect of the inability to lose your salvation, to turn from God. Um, because I think we see so much warning <laughs> throughout scripture yeah, yeah. to the body of Christ. I agree with you. You know, so, you know, 
I, I used to believe that it was, no, you can't lose your salvation, mm -hmm. you know, and I just think it's hard. I think that God doesn't give up on his people quickly, you know, and I would say never. Yeah. Yeah. I would say never in a sense that, you know, what I've made the point before, it's um, your heart grows so hardened. You've given over to a reprobate mind yeah. is the way that it's, yeah. it's classified. In scripture. Is that, right. does that, is that language speaking of Christians though? Or is that speaking of, of, um, I don't think that scripture's clear who it's speaking to. Right. I think that, uh, is it, I don't know. I need to look at that in context. Yeah. So tell me how, so I think, all right. So clearly I think you can lose salvation. Mm -hmm. You clearly say no, mm -hmm. but where are you on that? I don't think that a person that is truly justified would. And I think the sanctification walk, their body of work yeah. reveals whether they were truly justified. Okay. Makes sense. How do y'all with this scripture I've presented mm -hmm. in the old Testament, Ezekiel 18, how do you kind of, how does that fit in? I don't, this? to be honest, you just I, have to throw it out. Cause you're like, Hey, that was before Jesus. Is that no, 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 not at all. To be honest with you. I don't see how it, um, I don't see how it supports your view. I think I interpret it uh, well, differently. Than, well, it says a, if a righteous man turns from righteousness, mm -hmm. then they will die. So what makes us righteous? It's Christ, right? Yeah, but in the and, in the Old Testament, they were made righteous by the law, not uh, not saved by the law. They weren't. They were made righteous by faith, not not by doing the commands. That's that's actually what Jesus said was wrong when he came. He said, "Y'all Pharisees, you've got it wrong." Mm -hmm. You thought following these laws was what made you righteous. Well, you couldn't even follow them without faith in me, right? Because mm -hmm. he gives us that ability mm -hmm. to follow them. That kind of goes with what y'all are saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, but still, you know, God himself in Ezekiel says, if a righteous man turns from righteousness, mm -hmm. well, how can he be righteous and then turn from righteousness? I mean, there's a conundrum here Yeah, in y'all's view of this when mm -hmm. you take Ezekiel 18. Yeah, I think Deuteronomy 11 uh, verse 26 kind of kind of goes in line with Ezekiel just a bit. See, I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way that I'm commanding you today to go after other gods that you have not known. I think that by obeying the commandments in the Old Testament was a revelation of their faith. It's very similar to yeah. the sanctification process. Like what that, James talked about. Right? Yeah, it's just, I'll show you my faith by my works. Yeah. And I think that if, okay, <clears throat> they had faith, they had they had clear faith that Moses went up on Sinai, came down with some, some tablets. Mm -hmm. Those were the Ten Commandments, obviously. Yeah. But it wasn't, he wasn't up there long before they turned and started worshiping a golden calf Yeah, because their right. hearts were sinful. Right. It, and I think that that's what even the old Testament and the new Testament says, obedience leads to righteousness. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have been given the gift of the Holy spirit to be within us. And we've been given the, I think the entirety of the revealed will of God. And if we obey, if we obey what Jesus said at, throughout the entirety of scripture. Yeah. Obviously we don't have to, I don't think this. Yeah. If I eat bacon, I'm not going to hell. Yeah. Um, yeah. I agree with you. So if, if I don't, if I don't worship God on Saturday, but instead worship him on Sunday, I there for, there is for, there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Mm. Yeah. So I think that it was faith that was causing them to obey the commands and laws that he had given. Yeah. When they weren't obedient to those laws that were strictly given by God, then they were disobedient mm -hmm. and called then sons of the curse or sons of wrath. Yeah. For us, we have grace. We're in the age of grace. Whereas I don't think that they were mm. because Jesus came full of grace and truth. And I think that when we have been given the gift of faith to believe that Jesus is the Christ, he was the person foreshadowed throughout from Genesis all the way to the beginning of the New Testament, yeah. that there would come a, a redeemer kinsman, mm. uh, yeah. you know, in the lineage of David. So by us having the written scriptures to show us, okay, 
how can you not see that this is who he is? Yeah. But it's only when we have the gift of faith to have eyes to see and ears to hear. So I think that sanctification is very similar to them keeping the Old Testament. Faith was, okay, Moses has obviously got some, Moses obviously got some, some type of relationship with God that yeah. most of them didn't have. I mean, he came down off the mountain, his face was glowing. Yeah. So I think that bringing the the law down, okay, here's what you're to do if you want to live in blessing. Mm -hmm. For us, we have the Holy Spirit and the entirety of Scripture. Yeah. And if you read something and you're convicted by the Holy Spirit that lives within you, because the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same Spirit that dwells within you. Yeah. If the Holy Spirit convicts you of a particular thing that's in Scripture, you may not have freedom on that, but I may. So I think it's the same thing with with other things. But I'm not to use my freedom if it's going to be a stumbling block for mm -hmm. my brother. And yeah. I think that that's the importance of being led by the Holy Spirit during your sanctification walk. Yeah. Because once you've been given the gift of faith to believe Jesus is the King, is the Messiah, and the gospel is the good news that God, I'm no longer going to suffer the wrath and I become a child of God, then I'm a joint heir with Christ. Yeah. And, but now it's my responsibility to act like it yeah. through the sanctification process. And that's where my free will for me, that's where my free will kicks in. And obviously I'm, you know, I'm a spoiled brat at times and, and God will, God will discipline me. He says, yeah. if he doesn't discipline, then I'm a bastard. Yeah. You know, so I think that I'd, sometimes the discipline of God comes in so many forms and fashions. Sometimes it's just, he, he stirs me to repentance and, and tears. And it's just like, I'm convicted yeah. of my sin. And, and sometimes it comes through, uh, making stupid decisions that lead me into an astronomical amount of debt that I never know that I'm going to be able to get out of. And right. you suffer the penalty of that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but glorification <clears throat> is, and I, mean, I, I yeah. kind of wonder about the sheep and goat judgment. Yeah. Are those people that are the goats, are those people that are the goats, are they the ones that reject the work of the Holy Spirit in that cooperative effort of sanctification? Yeah. They're stubborn. Yeah. And they're just, so, okay, so I, I think that our two sides probably don't come together, you know, mm -hmm. really. I mean, they do come together in the end, but mm -hmm. I think that we, there's always going to be the people that look at it like I do. And the oh, sure. That look at it like you do. Yeah, but yeah. We, we still have an end result that mm -hmm. should be the same. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, <clears throat> and that's obedience to Christ. Absolutely. Yeah, right. So, so I think when, if your theology is running you amok and sin, mm -hmm. then you might need to consider <laughs> check your theology, your, your theology. Yeah, no right? doubt. And so <clears throat> that's what I've seen, um, just from a world, real world application with the theology, um, that you guys present, of, mm -hmm. you know, I've seen it, um, used to, well, you're still looking at pornography. It's yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. You know, you're still, you're just struggling. You're still a child of God. Well, <clears throat> what do you need to do? What do you need to tell yourself to get yourself out of that? Yeah, no doubt. <clears throat> maybe maybe you stop telling yourself that you're going to be fine. Mm -hmm. Maybe you start telling yourself, no. I, I agree with you. Fine. Yeah, and a, a misunderstanding that I've heard before of, of, the, of the perseverance of the <clears throat> saints is uh, once you've been saved, you have this, you have an immunity where you can sin and it's always okay. Mm -hmm. um, then that's a, that's a misunderstanding of the doctrine. Um, so the, the doctrine basically states that uh, once you have been saved, the Holy Spirit living in you will produce fruit of obedience and righteousness and, and uh, yeah. sanctification. Um if if you if somebody claims to be saved and then they continue going on in that sin, yeah. then that's fruit that that faith was never genuine. Um, and a, an old mentor of mine, something that he used to say that was really helpful to me was, um, is just for yourself, just just looking in internal internally, having that warning for yourself. Yeah, is. Uh, what am I making a practice of? What am I practicing? So. Yeah. Um, so if I, if I claim that I'm saved and I, and I function under this doctrine that, that if I'm saved, then I'm, I can't lose my salvation. 
but um, I'm still giving in to, to whatever temptation. I'm still going into the sin. What am I making a practice of? So do I need to console myself and say, man, I'm, I'm struggling, but, um, but I'm still a child of God? Or do I need to be sober and say, hey, are you sure? Yeah. Are, yeah, are you yeah. sure? Yeah. The, Start asking yourself some questions. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Kind yeah. of a, a litmus Absolutely. test that he would that he would say is which one are you practicing? Yeah. Are you are you pra- like just like a sport? You practice at the sport to get better at it. Are you mm. practicing your sin and getting better at your sin, or are you practicing righteousness? Yeah. And you failed over and over and over and over and over. Yeah. And something <laughs> something I take great comfort in personally is when, in I think you said it was Romans 7 this morning when Paul says, "Man, the 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 good that I want to do, I don't, and the yeah. the evil that I don't want to do, I still do it." Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so even if if this guy who wrote two thirds in the New Testament, had, that's a relate a relatable point between yeah. me and him. Right. It's like okay, that's that's some that's a little bit of comfort. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, uh, for people who are in my camp. It is that is a temptation for us to yeah, to yeah, like I can see that. like I'm still good I'm still you know like yeah. to to not take those warnings seriously yeah well that that's something <clears throat> that actually really helped me I mean <clears throat> when when you talk about these sins in our lives and these struggles um, that, you know changing my perspective and saying you know what I could if I keep doing this mm-hmm. I, could, I could lose my, my my salvation you know I could I could lose that birthright per se. Um, for me, that that assisted, I guess you yeah, could yeah, say. Yeah. The, the conviction is always there when mm-hmm, you're a yeah. child of God. You know, you're convicted of sin when you do that. So, um, <clears throat> but you, you really put a gun to your head in, mm-hmm. in, a, in a sense whenever you believe that if you don't stop yeah. doing that sin, that, you know, it could destroy you, not just on this earth, but and eternally. eternally. <clears throat> and I think with sin, uh, just to take it on a slightly different topic, um, Sin in general, well, we, we I think we probably all can agree that on this earth, if we're a child of God, we continue in sin, it will destroy us. I mean, oh, yeah. there, there right. will be consequences to sin. Clarify, destroy, define, destroy. So, so, so as uh, for a child of God, yeah. So, like, um, you keep looking at I keep going to pornography because mm-hmm. there's so many people nowadays that yes. struggle with mm-hmm. this. Um, so you go to you're looking at pornography and you don't stop. For years and years, you're doing this, and you keep going down the rabbit hole, looking at worse and worse stuff. Eventually, you start acting on it, and now you've, you know, lost your marriage at best. Maybe you're in prison for something vastly worse. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. So I'd yeah, say yeah, yeah. that's yeah. a consequence of continuing in our sin. So it it can Agreed. destroy us completely on this earth. Now, according to y'all's theology, God would be gracious. And Kyle would say maybe the millennial reign, you would be at the bottom of the totem pole. Well, that, but at least on salvation. And that kind of goes back to the, that kind of brings two things that we've talked about together. The the misunderstanding of the perseverance of the saints, where it's just an immunity to sin, mm-hmm. along with the, the warning aspect. So yeah. for me, somebody who goes down that route to the fullest extent, yeah. um, it's not, according to our view, God would still be gracious towards them. It yeah. is... God, that person is not justified. That person spoke Christianese. Uh, that person enjoyed the the practical benefits of being in the church. There's fellowship and yeah. good food and but I, I don't, know, things like that. But when do you get to say that? You know yeah, I mean? no. When that, when do you get to make that call? Right, because if there's a sin you're struggling with yourself, and you really can't even say that with this next person. And and then there's other questions: how you know it? What sin you're committing? Is it worse than what they're committing? Right. Right? Well, and, and I'm not I'm not saying to look at others. Paul tells us to examine ourselves. Yeah. I'm just talking about like that's why it ties together with the warning yeah. Yeah. of of uh, whole. Imagine a gun to my head because this could destroy me. Mm. So for me, it would be uh, hold a mag hold a magnifying glass to your heart. Are have you actually been redeemed? Is mm. the warning essentially? Yeah. Um, yeah. Like man. You're showing fruit that you're yeah. not actually redeemed. Get serious about it. And examine yourself. Um, Man, that's, uh, that's exam, tough, though. Examine I mean, yourself to show yourself approved. No, that's a different one. It's something. It's similar language, but it's there's one that says search your salvation. 
Is yeah, that, like work out your yeah. Work out your own salvation, fear and trembling. It's not that yeah. one, but it's same same okay. same yeah, yeah. tone or whatever. But uh, looking in the mirror. Yeah. yeah, I think that there is a passage of scripture in James since we just went through that in in Sunday mornings. Uh, James chapter five says, "My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins." That one would support. That one would support what I'm, I'm saying. Yeah, so say. I think that that would uh, that would be. <laughs> <laughs> so I think if we look at the parable of the prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son, he was raised in a home. He was obviously the father's son, obviously the father's son. I don't think he ever lost faith that he was the father's son mm-hmm. so much to the point that he asked for his inheritance before his dad died. Mm-hmm. He went out and spent all his money on prostitutes and wild living. And then obviously he gets to that point where he's eating the pig slop or he says, well, somebody just give me some of this. So he goes back home. I think that the go back home, we don't have an idea in our mind as humans in our finite little minds when that person will go back home. Yeah. You know, so I think that if that person goes back home, then they were truly justified because they've also been given the gift of repentance. Yeah. And even if they walked that road for 30, 40, 50 years, you see some people that it took them that long to to turn from their sins and walk back toward Jesus. Yeah. So I think that that is one of those where my butt is not big enough for that chair yeah. that is reserved only for the king. Yeah. So I don't get to determine that person was not ever truly justified. Yeah. We yeah. do have to, uh, you know, so many people have said it were fruit inspectors. Yeah. And I think that those things are a lot of times when in regards to a, a local fellowship. Yeah that we can't let just rampant sin run around a local fellowship because we're overseers of the flock. Yeah. Same thing in your family. It's just like, if you've got, if you've got, let's say you have four kids Yeah. and one of them, and I'm just using this as a hypothetical, um, gets into sexual sin of some sort, some weird sexual immorality, and they start to uh, worship some other God. Mm-hmm. You find a Ouija board in their bedroom uh, and they're 19 years old. What's going to be what's going to be your next step? You've got three other children that are under the age of 16. You got a 19 year old. OK, he's playing with a Ouija board. Um, he's doing all kinds of satanic stuff and he's in sexual immorality. Do you let him continue to fellowship in your home? And I think that that's where I th- where we have to be fruit inspectors. And if someone goes and shares the gospel with him or her and they come back to the way then then we welcome them back but yeah. it requires the gospel is the only thing that saves yeah um, so i think that we a lot of times want to put rules and regulations over particular things don't do this don't do that but if they hear the gospel and it, we just walk with them through the di- through discipleship i think what a lot of times people do it's just like you see those those hands get raised and nobody ever actually walks with them in discipleship Yeah, and actually opening, opening the scriptures and rightly divide the scriptures together. Kind of like what we're doing today. This is not a necessarily, a, this is great. This is a great conversation. I this think is, so. this is a great conversation because it causes me to go to the scriptures to it's like, Am I sure that I'm sure of what I believe? And I think that when you look at the word theology, it's the study of God. And the best book I know to study God is the Bible. Yeah. And I think that his character is revealed all through Scripture. I mean, Hebrews 13, 8 that we used in a service today. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I think that the gift of faith that you're talking about, just like it is faith. It is faith that that keeps them. Mm -hmm. It was faith in obeying the the Ten Commandments that kept them. uh, But it was a lack of faith when they broke them. Yeah, because they didn't trust him. It was very similar to Adam and Eve in the garden prior to sin coming. They Satan sowed an untruth about God's character and Eve was deceived. Yeah. And then Adam being led by Eve fell. Yeah. But I think that it's usually when an attack is against the character of God and he's pretty he's pretty firm. He's pretty firm. If he's this way in these five books, he's the same way in the rest of the books. Mm. I mean, it's 
God is love. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that does not mean <clears throat> he doesn't have rules and, and, and mandates. That's not, that's not necessarily tolerance. It's see just that, love. See what you said too, about if he's this way in these books, he's, he's the same. I mean, we agree God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I, I mean, even in the law, we can see the same with Jesus, mm-hmm. right? I mean, they're just, uh, there's a foreshadowing, but I, I think that we can't throw out this Old Testament. Uh, no, when we, no, no, when we, when we form not. our theology, and in my opinion, it's just this theology of, you know, predestination and eternal security, and they kind of go hand in hand, you know. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. And I just There's see three it, more that go along with it too. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I just see it. I just see it more um, in the New Testament. I mean, if I if I don't read the Old Testament, mm-hmm. then I'm going to lean that way. So it, right, let's just with election. I think yeah. it's. I think uh, we see it in the Old Testament very clearly. So um, who is Israel? God's chosen people. Yeah. Uh, what did What did God do to other nations for the sake of Israel's well being? He sent some nations against them. He absolutely destroyed. He some destroyed of them too. some of them. Yeah, he, he, killed, did, he did a lot kill for them. Kill women, children, yeah. animals. Kill them all. Yeah. Because you're my precious chosen people. Yeah, but, but um, that's a different topic. Like, why did he do that with women and children? Well, you know? but the the point the is Nephilim topic. Maybe the point is right? is yeah, but it was because yeah. God's chosen people. But the yeah. the point is is the pattern of God choosing that we that is not absent in the Old Testament. Yeah. Um. Why did he choose <laughs> Jacob and not Esau? Um, you know, there's, he, he, there's, there's examples of God choosing a specific people or a specific person. Mm-hmm. Um, why did he choose the line of Judah? Why did he choose David? And why did he choose that lineage? Yeah. Um, you know, there, so God looking at, I, in my opinion, those, those old, the old Testament does not lack evidence of those, uh, doctrines. Yeah. I, I agree <clears throat> with you on that. Mm-hmm. I just think that this 18, mm-hmm. I think God speaks clearly on it, on the topic. That's my opinion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we can see that in 18, 24. So I will say, uh, from my point of view, there's an assumption. I'm not saying it's wrong, but I'm yeah. saying it is an assumption that... Let me get there. 18, 24. But when a righteous man turns away from his right, from his righteousness, commits iniquity, and does according to all the abominations that a wicked man does, will he live? Question mark. All his righteous deeds which he has done will not be remembered for his treachery, which he has committed, and his sin which he has has committed. For them he will die. So for that, uh, but when a righteous man turns away, to support your view and what you're saying with that verse, it requires an assumption that a righteous man is uh synonymous or means synonymous with or means a saved man mm-hmm. um so and i don't i don't think at least in the old, i correct me if i'm wrong here but i don't know if in the old testament or at least in ezekiel's time if they had that sort of clear explicit language of like saved from sin saved from the the same way that we do after jesus is clarifying it mm-hmm. in the new testament um, I could be wrong on that, but as, but the, so a view that is supported heavily by, I'll say old and new Testament scriptures, uh, one verse in old Testament that requires an assumption that righteous means save righteous means having salvation is, is allowing that entire doctrine to be unraveled. Um, it's a, it's, it's, it's throwing a rock at a building and like crumbling the building with one, that one rock is kind of the way I see that. Does that, was that clear at all? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I, I, I may have kind of lost it there. I, yeah. I understand what you're saying as far as if righteousness, if you're equating salvation of the new Testament with righteousness as Ezekiel. 18. Mm, no. So, so, uh, the, all of the evidence pointing to, and I will, I'll say, I will say this, there's evidence pointing to both sides. I'm not making. I'm not making a claim. Yeah, I'm not making a claim that that 
your side has no ground to stand on, right. not at all. I agree with that 100%. So all of the evidence. <laughs> there's, 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 a, there's definitely a case to make for yeah. your side, too. Yeah. Oh, but, yeah, for sure. There's there's bo- there's material on both sides, so, for sure. So can we come in agreement that one of us is could be wrong and the other is right? Oh, yeah. One of, one of us is wrong and one of us is right. But, but yeah. we're, not, we're not 100% on that. We may have a strong conviction. Yeah. But, oh, yeah, I can, I'll, I'm comfortable with that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Kyle, do you agree with that? Oh yeah, yeah. So kind of, kind of what I'm, what I'm trying to say with, what I'm trying to say with this is, uh, all of, all of the evidence for our, for my side, uh, it seems is being unraveled by this one verse for you, right? (laughs) And and that and that one verse requires an assumption that righteous means saved. Righteous means having sal means having salvation. Yeah. Um, when, when they didn't, God didn't even, other than prophecies, other than, uh, prophecies pointing forward to the Messiah, that language of being saved from sin uh, wasn't as explicitly clear as it is after Jesus clarified it. So do y'all want to hit another topic or do you want to do that another day? Let's do that another day. Let's save it for another day. I don't even know how far in we are right now. Look at that little recorder on the bookshelf next to you. What's that timestamp say? Hour and thirty six. We're an hour and thirty six minutes yeah, in. We're so, done. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We but I will. I think that staying on that same topic just for a minute or two. Yeah, I, go ahead. I think that Ezekiel eighteen. I think you bringing that passage of scripture to light. Yeah. I never really looked at it, and I need to study that a little bit more. Yeah. I I think that one. Abraham was was faithful way before the law was brought in. Yeah. But I think that that was the the parting of the Red Sea and Moses. He was choosing his people. Mm-hmm. You know, he was choosing his people. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, the waters would not have swallowed Pharaoh and all those chariots. Yeah. So when they came out on the other side of the Red Sea and they walked in in the desert for 40 years, it was in a sense, it was a sanctification process. Yeah. It's foreshadowing. It was a for, it was a foreshadowing of Christ that you're going to have to choose obedience. It was even called the red sea. But see, but see, even with that, I still believe outside of Israel, there were others saved and that that's a different topic. uh, There, yeah, there's some grafted in Ruth is a, Ruth is an example of that. But I think that with that chosen people, what declared them as chosen. Now, I mean, obviously, when Abraham, I mean, you know, circumcision was you got to do this, yeah. sign, sign right? Of, sign of the covenant. So keeping of the Ten Commandments was the sign of your chosenness. You're part of the chosen race if you do this, because yeah. even Jesus says you send these people out to these these far off places and they become proselytes, yeah. and you're trying to get them to come and, but the law always brings death. Mm. The law always brings death because you can be saved by Christ alone. But with that being said, when they disobeyed against the law, when they disobeyed against the law, I mean, the enemies were able to destroy them. And it wasn't until they repented and they got back in alignment with what God had dictated as his commandments that he was back on their side. I mean, yeah. God divorced Israel. Yeah, in Scripture, mm. does not say that. I don't. I don't know. I don't. <laughs> well, it sounds like you're supporting my my side again. So <laughs> show me, show me, show me if it does say the word divorce. It's that that word. That's the word I have an issue with. Uh, not. I think, I think it says something like that. I, I'm not remembering that. That's maybe, gonna maybe be I'm a, wrong. Maybe not that word. Because because think about how many times Israel was unfaithful and God said, you've been so incredibly unfaithful, you've hoarded yourself out to other gods, but I'm going to remain faithful and continue. Like Jeremiah 3. It's it's not the idea of God. No, I get it. Like shunning them for a bit. Yeah. It's that it's that specific word, divorce. That's yeah. the one I'm... Jeremiah 3. I'm, I'm probably going to want to go to Man, Blue I'm, Letter Bible I've for this too. This. Me too. This I have very much. Good. Yeah. Yeah. It's been very cordial too. Yeah. I've enjoyed that part. Y'all of got that. a I'm different gonna... perspective in here. Yeah. So verse eight, she saw where you that. At? Sorry, where are you at? Uh, Jeremiah three verses eight through ten. Okay. She saw that for all the adulteries of the faithless one Israel, I had sent her away with a decree of divorce. 
Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but she too went and played the whore. Because she took her whoredom lightly, she polluted the land, committing adultery with stone and tree. Yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah did not return to me with her whole heart, but in pretense, declares the Lord. Okay. All right, and the same there. type of language God used here in Ezekiel is treachery. It, it right? is treachery. It's it's basically it's spiritual fornication. Yeah, because because we're in covenant with God. Yeah, you're married you know? to Him. Yes. And when you put anything before God, you are you are committing spiritual yeah. fornication. You are you are having adultery. Right. I think that that is why the book of Hosea is in there. It kind of gives you that depiction. He will continue to take you back, but repentance has to transpire. And I think that because of because of the New Testament, because of the New Covenant, which is better than the Old Covenant. We have we have grace because Christ fulfilled the law. No one could do it. He did it. And I think that with that being said, if you've been given the gift of faith to believe that Jesus completed the work mm -hmm. to tell us die, it's finished. But But those people, nobody could do it, right? So, only Jesus. Only Jesus. Yeah. And so <clears throat> those people weren't judged that way for heaven and hell. No, no. Because but they couldn't even fulfill it themselves. A hundred percent. But they had so to the be. the same type of. Yeah. The same way that God judges, uh, judged them then is judged on us now. It's our heart. God looks inwardly is what the scriptures say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and so if, if you've been given a new heart, you're, you're a child of God. Right. The difference I think is that before we saw. Holy Spirit didn't, you know, the Holy Spirit wasn't there. The Holy Spirit would maybe rest on them at times. There's but, a few people he was in. We'd mentioned yeah, that, that yeah, came up a few weeks ago. There's not very many, though. You're right. Okay, yeah. but generally, <clears throat> the yeah, Holy yeah. Spirit yeah. wasn't there, rest on people. But then now Jesus comes and he's sent us the Holy Spirit to to give us a new heart, which was prophesied on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but yet we still see this conundrum that we can sin. Oh, yeah. It's, I mean? uh, and that yeah. we can turn. We can turn away. Yeah. And so. It, well, it, there's a. Oh, man, I just looked at it this morning. Um, beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your souls. So the flesh is we still have this sin nature. And then again, Paul, that would. The things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. Yeah. And then there's one more that popped in my head, but I'm, I lost it now. Um, oh, um, but each one is tempted when he is he is uh, lured and enticed by his own desires. And then whenever, when temptations breed, gives way to sin, sin breeds death, something along those lines. But yeah, so each each one is lured and tempted by his own desires. That which I want to do, I don't. That's what I don't want to do, I do. And... Um, abstain from the passions of your flesh which wage war against your soul so that yeah we're, we absolutely still have the the um the flesh the sinful nature that we have to battle against it's not at the moment of justification and and rebirth the temptation and and sinful nature is not completely removed we're we're just we're given a new heart and uh yeah we're given the ability to to i, I to, think but we're no longer slaves to that i think we we just don't uh, as Christians, we don't maybe have a full grasp of what God's doing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, oh, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. It's yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's just like we probably have like this much and maybe not even that much. Yeah. Yeah. What and, is, what is uh, prophesying part? No in part, yeah. prophesying part. What is that? Yeah. And, and then that uh, one's 12, first Corinthians. First, yeah. yeah. And then there was another one that I just looked at today. Anyway. So maybe next time we can talk about um, gifts of the Spirit or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that one. I got some examples of that. I'd like Jeez. to share. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think we agree on. I think the the whole discussion on the gifts is going to be like ninety five percent semantics. I, yeah. I really think that we're going to agree a lot on that. I think so too, and I think after we watched that podcast, uh, you know, that roundtable yeah, discussion, I think that kind of fleshed it out. It yeah, like, y'all are saying the exact same thing. <laughs> yeah, <almost>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's good for our listeners to. Because a lot of people don't talk about this stuff. And you'll see yeah. some really good debates and topics that, you know, some of the people put out. But yeah. I think it's good to have a different audience talking about things. As long as we can back up what we're saying with Scripture and not just yeah. use our own ideas. Because I can tell you one thing. 
if it ain't lined up with scripture, it is not the mind of God. Yeah. 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 I agree with that a hundred percent. Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, which are passing away, but we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom, which God predestined before the ages to our glory. So the mystery, that was the key word that made me think of that mystery, mystery. Well, thanks for pondering the pages with us for a while <laughs> and uh, hanging out on the board. I enjoyed it. I did too. Same here. So next time you're gonna have to come 6:30 a.m. Whew. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> killing me. You're killing me small. Uh, after you do it a few times, you get used to it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What, you a coffee drinker? I will be. You will be <laughs> drinking a few cups on, on that day. <laughs> we can we can take a pee break anytime. So yeah. All right. See ya. See ya. See ya.